We're in lesson uh, 26 uh, tonight uh, in Isaiah chapter 11. Uh, I'd like us to read the two uh, verses. Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 and uh, uh, 10. And we'll give Naomi verse 1 and Tammy verse 10. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his root shall bear fruit. In verse 10 of Isaiah 11. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, who shall stand as a banner to the people. For the Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. On its face, it appears like this is a messianic prophecy we've studied before. What, what, what one might we at first glance think that this is similar to that we've studied before? The root of Jesse. Speaking of the root of Jesse? Yeah, that's what we're speaking on tonight. But uh, my question was, so we at first glance, this might sound like a prophecy we've covered before. Uh, this is a genealogy prophecy. And so what might what other prophecy that we've studied in this long time ago might this sound similar to at first glance? David. David. Oh, we know Jesse is David's father. And so you say, well, of course, if Jesus or the Messiah was to be of the seed of David, of course he'd be of the seed of Jesse because Jesse's David's father. But I think doing so really misses what Isaiah is is talking about here. In our page, it's very, it, you, those online don't have the book, but um, on our page is an illustration of, um, of, uh, of a tree stump. If you want to kill a tree, what do you have to do? You have to up plant it. But, but if you have this huge tree, like some of the tall maples that have been around for 50 to 100 years, is it really possible to get to the roots? That or Is it easy, let's just say, to get to the roots? No, it's not. Because the roots are not just down a little bit. They've gone all the way down, and they're big. You would have to really dig up all the ground around it with a huge, probably, bulldozer uh, to get to the roots of the tree. So, what you've done this, Bill, I'm sure. What what do you have to do uh, to kill a tree that, like I said, if you can't really dig up its roots, what do you do to it? Yeah, there's different things you could do. You're basically trying to kill the roots without digging it up. What happens if you chop a tree down, leaving the stump, but don't do those things? It'll grow again. Branches, like little shoots, will come off of it. And if you let it grow, the tree you'd find will grow again. That's what we're going to be talking about this evening. There is going to come a time in Judah's history. Remember Isaiah is prophesying during the days of Hezekiah and the days of Manasseh. When would the house of David see a time in which you might describe the tree being cut down? The kings not ruling. Oh, no, no, I'm talking about David. I'm talking about, remember, Isaiah's prophesying in the days of Hezekiah. Kings of Judah have been ruling on the throne of David for over 200 years by that point. Uh, almost two, almost 300 years by that point. And, but there would come a time when kings would stop ruling. The tree would be cut down. When would that time be? What was the time that Isaiah's prophesying about? that's still in the future from Hezekiah. We studied it in Daniel. But 
Babylonian captivity, all right? The Babylonian captivity is going to, Nebuchadnezzar is going to come. And if you read the genealogies found in Matthew, Jeconiah, sometimes called Coniah, sometimes called Jehoachin, is the lineage from where Christ comes. However, he's not the last king of Judah. Zedekiah is the last king of Judah, and that's, that's, Jeho that's Jehoiachin's uncle. But after Zedekiah, there would be no more kings of Judah. Not another king. Zerubbabel, that when he comes back, he's governor, not king. And his son doesn't become governor, and his son doesn't become governor, and his son doesn't become governor. We don't, King Herod is nowhere near related to the house of David when we get to the times of Jesus. So you could come along and say the tree was cut down, and in fact it had been prophesied by Jeremiah that it would. Bill, you want to get Jeremiah chapter 22. We're going to read a couple verses. Well, let's all go to Jeremiah 22. We're going to get verses 24 to 30. We'll do two verses each. Uh, Jeremiah 22. To 24 to 30. <clears throat> Two verses? Two verses, yes. As I live, says the Lord, when I, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were the signet on my right hand, yet I would pluck you off, and I will give you into the hand of those who seek your life, and into the hand of those who face you fear, the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and the hand of the Chaldeans. So uh, we are cast your hearts, and your mother before you, into another country where you were not born, and there you shall die. And to the land to which the desert return, then it shall not be. Did this man, Kaniah, despise broken pot, a vessel no one cares for? Why are he and his children hurled and cast into a land that they do not know? O land, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, Break this man down as childless, a man who shall not prosper in his days. For none of his descendants shall prosper, sitting on the throne of David and ruling anymore in Judah. Okay. Kuniah is Joachim because he's talked about the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah. Well, the son of Jehoiakim, you read 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles, is Jehoiachin. This man had three different names that he is known as. Jehoiachin, Jeconiah, Coniah. I guess it's all, it's all the same man. And, and so it depends which book you're in as to, as to what name you're going to get. Uh, and you know, since we're in Jeremiah, he's often called Coniah. And we find here that Jeremiah, who's prophesying at the time that this is all taking place, is saying that, Kuniah, you were the signet of my right hand, yet I would pluck you off. He reigned only three months in Jerusalem before Nebuchadnezzar deposed him and put Zedekiah in his place. Everything that Jeremiah spoke of concerning Jeconiah came to pass. In other words, he was taken off into captivity. Now, the end of Second Chronicles would say that following the death of Nebuchadnezzar, he was actually released from prison uh, under Abel Merodach, uh, the next king of Babylon after Nebuchadnezzar died. And he sat, uh, like I said, he was treated quite well. But he didn't come back to Judah. Like I said, he never came back. He didn't come back with the captives. He died in Babylon. Verse 30 is an interesting verse. What does verse 30 tell us about Joachim? Verse 30. And the house of David in total. All right, he wasn't going to prosper. Why? Childless. 
But he, I mean, he's, he's write this man down as childless. And, and so, in the sense, if, if no king is going to reign on the throne of David, it's as if Jeconiah is childless. Now, there is debate as to Shealtiel, who is recorded as the son of Jeconiah, as to how this is how he is the son. Because when you read Second Chronicles, uh, I, I don't know if it's Second Chronicles or First Chronicles. First Chronicles. Uh, and no, not, not that one. If you read, I think it is First Chronicles. But you read through the lists, the genealogy lists that we often skip. And you get down to Zerubbabel and Shealtiel, who are mentioned there. And there is debate as to whether Shealtiel is the literal son of Jeconiah, or whether he is the uh, son who is counted as the son of Jeconiah. Sort of like how uh, Obed is the son of Boaz and Ruth. But under the Leveret marriage terms, would actually be counted as the inheritor of Elimelech's household under their under their inheritance rules. That's why it was so important that Ruth marry someone of close kin, so that he would inherit Ruth's husband's um, share of of that inheritance. That's why it was that important that that's who Ruth married. Uh, she couldn't just marry anyone if that was to be the case. And so, uh, they, he was the literal son of Boaz and Ruth, but the legal son of, of Elimelech and I can never remember whether it's Malon or Chilion that Ruth, Ruth uh, married. It's, I think it's Malon. Uh, but, but, um, uh, like I started, there is inheritance, and there's like there's legal sons and an actual sons. Like I started, that, that we do have a little bit of that, and I do deal with that. I think in our podcast, and I can't remember which chapter it is, as because some people have a problem with this and they say, well, Jeremiah said Jeconiah was to be childless, and yet Shealtiel's his son. How did that come true? And that's one way that it could have come true, that he wasn't his literal son, but he was counted as his son um, uh, bec through, through, this, um, uh, through, through another means. However, there's also a way that this isn't being literal here. Like as far as dying childless in connection with no one of his descendants proper, prospering, you have in the same verse... How do you have descendants if you're childless, if you get my drift? And so Jeremiah might not literally be saying he's going to have no children, but because none of them will sit on the throne of David, it's as if he did. Because that's the only way that that would happen. That they're, like I said, under normal circumstances, that the children had the right to the throne of their parents, or of their father. And that that didn't happen. But Jeremiah's prophes prophesying that no one from the house of David, after, Jer after Jeconiah, is going to sit on the throne of David. That's a big, big prophecy. Because what are premillennialists looking for today? An earthly kingdom with... Jesus sitting on the throne of David. That's exactly what they're looking for. And yet, if that is exactly true, then what's Jeremiah talking about here? No one would prosper sitting on the throne of David. None of his descendants would. We'll get to how Jesus fulfills this in a few moments. But we have to realize something about the Messiah here is he was going to come from the seed of David. So he's going to come from the kingly family. But he's not going to be the same type of king as David. 
Because David's family was cut off from being king. He's going to be a different king. He's going to he's going to be that sprig. In other words, he's going to be he's going to be an offshoot of the seed of David. He's like as far as God didn't kill the family of David through the captivity. He cut up he cut down the tree, but he didn't kill it. And so we have this sprig that's that's going to uh, that's going to grow, but it's not the same tree. It's not going to grow into the big tall tree that becomes kings of Judah again, in the same sense. So the root of Jesse, we have to realize from passages like Isaiah 11 and passages like Zechariah 6 was going to rise from the family of David, and but it's going to be a branch that grows out of its roots. In other words, there was something happened in between. And so that growth, when we get to the New Testament, we find out is Jesus. And in fact, we've seen this numerous times before. We know from our past studies that the tribe of Judah was going to be the kingly tribe. It was chosen during the days of David uh, to be the tribe through whom the Messiah would come. But rulers were going to come from Judah. Judah led the family even in the days of Jacob. Uh, when it came to the end of Jacob's life, we see Judah in the forefront, not Reuben, not Levi, not Simeon. We see Judah uh, at the forefront. But if we're going to have the Messiah, the Christ, he's going to have to fulfill two things. He is going to have to be from the tribe of Judah or to build. Bill, you want to get Hebrews chapter 7, verse 14. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 14. For, for it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. Now, we studied this verse before. On the only point we're going to be making from it, it's evident that that. The Lord, our Lord, Jesus Christ, arose from Judah. If he is going to be the Messiah, he has to come from the tribe of Judah. He, he wasn't going to be from the tribe of Levi. That's the Hebrew writer's uh, uh, explanation here about priesthood. But he had to be from the tribe of Judah. Anyone coming from any other tribe doesn't have, uh, doesn't have connection to... Uh, the kingship, the kingdom. There's no one, uh, no one ruled over the house of the United Nation of Israel from any other uh, tribe. The north was ruled by men from many tribes of the north, but not Judah. Judah was only ruled from the house of David, but it wasn't from the from the tribe of Judah. Only though those from David's family could be described as the Messiah as well. Henry, you want to get Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, and Naomi, Luke chapter 1, verses 31 through 33. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Okay, Matthew's making a point. Who are the two main patriarchs that he is, he is, uh, Pointing Jesus to, and what is the significance of both? Who are the two patriarchs in Matthew 1, verse 1, that Matthew is pointing the Jews to concerning Jesus? And why is he doing it? David and Abraham. Why Abraham? Promise was given to Abraham. So, Messiah had to come from Abraham. In you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. But he also wanted to point him to David. King comes from David. And that's why Matthew starts the way he does. He could have simply started with Abraham. But the list is organized in the beginning to go from Abraham to David. And then the list is reorganized to start at David 
and to go all the way through the end of the kings. And then it's reorganized again to show that offspring, that offshoot from the captivity to Jesus. You ever wondered why Matthew divided it the way he did? That's a possible reason why he did it. Yes, he has his 14s. But why did he divide it the way he did? He went from Abraham to David because that's the seed of promise. David to the end of the kings because kings come from David. But then we have that Isaiah prophecy, the, the sprig out of the root of Jesse. David's line didn't end with Nebuchadnezzar. It continued. And it would come down to Christ. None of the people, though, in that list, we only have two of the 14 names after Jeconiah listed in Scripture, Sheltiel and Zerubbabel. The rest of the names, we have no idea who these men are apart from their names. None. No Scripture's written about them. Nothing about these men. In fact, people have trouble with Luke and Matthew deciphering who, Joseph, who Joseph's father was. They say, well, there's Heli, and then there's Jacob. Is this talking about two different, uh, two different men? I believe there's an answer to that, that one of them's Mary's, one of them's Mary's uh, genealogies, but uh, some, try to, some try to go about and say, well, Again, we have this legal son versus the leverage marriage, actual son thing going on here. It's possible, but uh, that's what I don't, I don't, I don't agree with that. But we have the genealogy split like this, I think, on purpose. Whereas Luke doesn't split them like that. Luke just starts at the end and goes to the beginning all the way back to Adam. Makes no mention of anything other than... These are the names. Son of, son of, son of, son of, son of, and all the way back. Uh, all the way back to Adam, because Luke has a different purpose. Luke chapter 1, verses 31 to 33. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Okay, Luke's making a point, Angel Gabriel is here speaking, but Luke's making a point here in Luke chapter 1, you're going to bring forth a son, call his name Jesus, we discussed that already, he's going to be called Great, the Son of the Most High, but I'm going to give him the throne of his father David. So Gabriel here is announcing that Jesus would be king. The Jews misunderstood this prophecy, thinking that the Messiah is going to be an earthly king. He is going to be a king that um, uh, he is going to be a king that kicks out the Romans. It's going to be the second great kingdom of Judah or Israel under the Davidic king kings. Uh, that come from David. Under, uh, it'll be the second great one. Whereas God didn't say that at all. He said no one will prosper. And so if no one will prosper, if Jeremiah said no one will prosper, that must mean no one will prosper. In this earth, Jesus certainly didn't. He wasn't a king on this earth. And yet, he is a king. And so... We have to establish Jesus' uh, heritage from the tribe of Judah and the house of David if he is going to be the Christ. And we've done that many times. Question is, does uh, verse 11 of Isaiah 11, or sorry, verse 10 of Isaiah 11, said he is, that the Messiah is going to stand as a banner to his people. What does a banner to his people mean? What's a banner? Uh, 
that designates a group. Okay. So if, if, if someone if someone's having a banner day, we, we sometimes will, will talk about that. It's an old phrase. If someone's having a banner day, what kind of day they have? It's a great day. It's a great. It's a day worth noting, and so it's a day that people would really love. They'd love to copy that day. And so, if you're going to be a banner to your people, people are going to want to follow you. They're going to want to imitate you. And so, we have to say, is Christ a banner to His people? And the answer, of course, is yes. Oh, let's get some passages. Uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. That'll be Tammy's. 1 Peter 2, verse 21. We Bill's. Uh, Henry, John 14, verse 6. And uh, Naomi, Romans 15, 7 to 9. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. And I me, just as I also indicate Christ. Paul's telling the Corinthians here, I'm imitating Christ. And as I imitate Christ, you imitate me. Because you're indirectly imitating Christ if I'm imitating Christ. You wouldn't want to imitate someone. That's not good. That's not going to lead you someplace you want to go. Christ is a banner. First Peter 2, 21. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Okay. In what way does Peter say we follow Christ's steps? Well, he suffered, so we, we must endure our suffering. Yeah. But he showed us the way out. Because he showed us there's victory in suffering. So, a lot of times people don't want to be Christians because there's, it's hard. And if we had no example to follow, why would anyone want to suffer? No one wants to suffer. But Christ suffered for us first that we can endure through the suffering that we might have because he is an example for us. And, in other words, he's gotten down in the hole with us. We have, we have a friend who's gotten down in the hole with us and we might say, well, why would you jump in the hole with me? He says, well, I've been down here before. I'll know the way out. Christ is that way out because he suffered and died for us. He was victorious over death. And so we can follow in his footsteps if we do that. Jesus is the way. He uh, is, the, is the one we should follow. Henry, you want to get John 14, verse 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, can, no one comes to the Father except the truth. So if I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can get to the Father except through Jesus Christ, we have to follow him. There's no way, Allah, or Muhammad is not the way to God. Confucius is not the way to God. Buddha is not the way to God. I'm not the way to God. You're not the way to God. Jesus is the way to God. So you have to follow him. Romans 15, 7-9. For welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to you your name. All right, Jesus came to the Jews. He came to the Jews, he preached among the Jews, but his religion is not a Jewish religion. The Gentiles praise his name too. 
And that's the real, uh, Paul would say, it's the real mystery of how God saved mankind because usually we think of national religions. We have national politics and national religions. A lot of people want to call, are we a Christian nation? No, we're not. Because there's no such thing as a Christian nation. Christ's kingdom breaks down all borders. It's not to be a national religion in the sense of Canada's religion. It would be great if more Canadians were Christians. But even if the vast majority of Canadians were Christians, that doesn't make us a Christian nation. Because Christ is king over all. And, and so the Jews and the Gentiles were going to praise God. We're going to pay, praise Christ. So Christ is a banner. He is a banner. And, and the Messiah has to be a banner if he's going to fill out, fulfill Isaiah 11. But he also has to be a ruler on his throne in a place other than Jews. Because no one is going to prosper sitting on the throne of David and ruling in Jerusalem. Well, Christ, of course, is the ruler on the throne of David, but he is in heaven. Uh, Tim, you want to get Hebrews 7, verse 17. Uh, this is Bill, Zechariah chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. And Henry, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1. But Hebrews 7, verse 17. For he testifies, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. King forever. He is king and he is priest. So he is high priest and king. Not usual. We discussed that too, that it is not usual that, that the... Uh, King and priesthood were of the same place, but it is what it is what is found. Zechariah chapter six, verses twelve and thirteen. Uh, then speak to him, saying, "Thus says the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, from his place he shall branch out, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Yes, and he shall build the temple of the Lord." He shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule on his soul. So he shall be a priest on his soul, and the council of peace shall be between them both. Okay. So Zechariah is maintaining that this branch is going to be both priest and king on the same throne. Well, what does Hebrews chapter 8 verse 1 say? Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. So this tells us where Christ is ruling. This tells us where Christ is ruling. He is ruling on the right hand of God. He is ruling on the throne of David because he is of the seed of David. It's not an earthly throne. It is a spiritual throne. He is ruling in heaven, and he is king today. Christ is the fulfillment of this prophecy. But lest we think that we're just pulling this out of the air, Paul says so in Romans 15, verse 12, which said, And again Isaiah said, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. In him the Gentiles shall have hope. Christ is the root of Jesse. He did reign. He is reigning. He is the fulfillment of this prophecy. So the root of David, in whom the Gentiles have hope, is Jesus Christ. The fulfillment of that prophecy, the Messianic prophecy. I am not a